ክብራትና ክብራን ተመልካቾቻችን እንደምንላችሁ ይህ ቲጂ ቴሌቪዥን ነው አዘገድና አቅራቢ መስፍን በዙናኝ ተመልካቾቻችን ባለፈው ዝግጅት በዚህ በዋሽንግተን ዲሲ ከተማ ኢትዮጵያን በተመለከተ በሴንተር ፎር ስትራቴጂክ ኤንድ ኢንተርናሽናል ስቴዲስ አማካኝነት ታላቅ ስብሰባ መድረጉን ገልጨ ነበር በዚህም ስብሰባ ላይ ከተለያዩ ቦታ የመጡ ባለሙያዎች የኢትዮጵያ ኤምባሲ ተወካዮችና እንዲሁም የግንቦስ ሰባት አመራር አባላት ተገንተው ነበር በመጨረሻ ላይ የተካሄደው ስብሰባ ኢትዮጵያ ሪጅናል ሊደርሺፕ በሚደረስ የተዘጋጀ ነበር በዚህም ስብሰባ ላይ ቶም ኬኒየን የፕሮጀክት ሆፕ ፕሬዝዳንት እና ዋና ስራ አስፈጻሚ ኢጄ ሆገንደርን በኢንተርናሽናል ክራይሲስ ግሩፕ የአፍሪካ ጉዳይ ረዳት ፕሮግራም ዳይሬክተር እና እንዲሁም ፕሮፌሰር ዴብራ ፕሮቲጋም ከጆንስ ሆፕኪንስ ዩኒቨርሲቲ እጽጥ ፍሲሆን ስብሰባውን የሚመሩት ጄንፈር ኩክ በሲኤስአይኤስ የአፍሪካ ፕሮግራም ዳይሬክተር ናቸው እነዚህ ሞራን ስለ ኢትዮጵያ እድገት ስለ ኢትዮጵያ ለውጥ ጥሩ ከተናገሩ በኋላ ነበር ግንቦስ ሰባትን ወክሎ የተገኙት የግንቦስ ሰባት አመራራባል የሆኑት ባሁኑ ጊዜ ስለ ኢትዮጵያ ጥሩ ነገር አለመናገር በጣም አስፈላጊ ነው ብለው የተናገሩት ጄንፈር ኩክም ስብሰባውን በዚህ አይነት መልክ ነበር የጀመሩት መከታተል Okay. Um, I am apologies for interrupting conversations, but we're going to move to our uh, third and final panel. Um, I'm afraid that I missed the first two sessions today, but as you know, the first session looked at the US bilateral relationship and some of the governance issues and the dilemmas uh, in a way of of US engagement on the on the governance side. Our second panel uh, looked at the health aspect and then Ethiopia's, uh, the work that's being done in Ethiopia on health. This third panel is taking a slightly broader look and putting Ethiopia into a broader context and kind of its role in the region, in Africa, and uh, external relations. So with us today, we have Tom Canyon, uh, Tom Kenyon, I'm sorry, who is um, CEO of Hope Project Hope. Um, Tom is going to talk a little bit, and you have their biographies um, with you. Tom is going to talk about uh, Ethiopia's role on health in the region, uh, the New Africa CDC, some of the work that uh, and in Ethiopia's engagement on, during the Ebola crisis. Um, next, we have E.J. Hugendorn of the Crisis Group, who's going to talk about Ethiopia's leadership within the region, engagement on security, engagement in Sudan on diplomacy, um, and, and uh, uh, perhaps more broadly, with the African Union. And finally, yet to join us, she's on her way, is Deborah Brodingham, a longtime uh, scholar of uh, China's engagement in Africa, um, looking at another of uh, Ethiopia's major bilateral relationships with China and talk about how that's affecting um, Ethiopia, how it's affecting Ethiopia's strategy, perhaps what the downturn, economic downturn in China might mean for some of the big investments that have been going forward. So we're going to try to keep remarks uh, fairly brief to uh, have enough time for discussion, and we'll try to end promptly at 1 o'clock. So Tom, why don't you begin? Well, Welcome. thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to talk about uh, the, the story around the formation of the Africa CDC, Ethiopia's role in that, and, uh, and the link with Ebola. And I'm, I'm describing this in the context, I was CDC country director in Ethiopia from, for five years, from 2009 to 2013, and then as CDC in charge of global health up until uh, just a few months ago. And in both of those positions, I was fortunate to have uh, involvement in, in this exciting new development. Uh, and you may have heard of uh, the development of the Africa CDC when, when Secretary Kerry and Chairperson Zuma Lamini signed a memorandum of co cooperation where the U.S. would help with the formation of the Africa CDC. The, the formation of the Africa CDC was actually Ethiopia's idea. Uh, it was proposed when they held the presidency of the African Union in 2013, uh, Prime Minister Haile Mariam, it was his first event really uh, in the African Union following the passing of, of Prime Minister Melez. And they, and they wanted to make a mark on that uh, historic uh, event. Uh, 
and proposed that Africa have a CDC, which was a surprise to everyone. This came out of nowhere. Um, and, but in my own involvement, I trace it back to when we hosted at the US CDC, uh, then Minister Kaseti Burhan, as Ethiopia was making its own plans to form a public health agency, in addition to an FDA-like agency, in addition to a supply chain, because the government was maturing its health system. And I think at that time, they saw the value of having a public health agency that can support, in our case, 50 states, in Africa's case, 54 nations. And having an, an agency that's objective, supportive, facilitates uh, investigations and outbreaks and so forth uh, was deemed of, of value to Africa as well. So that was the origin of the proposal. But like I said, it caught everybody off guard. Health ministers didn't see this coming. So after that pronouncement in mid-2013, it had to go back to the health ministers to now process this and digest this and come up with a way forward because, of course, they're going to be responsive to their head of state. So that went through a series of, of, of meetings. We were privileged to be involved in CDC. We hosted uh, a working group in Atlanta to, start, to brainstorm on just where would you start, uh, given all of the, the public health challenges that Africa has faced, is facing, and could face in the future. That happened to occur at the time of the peak of the Ebola outbreak in mid-2014. So after we discussed many options, HIV, TB, malaria, non-communicable diseases, on and on and on, uh, we resorted to starting. And our advice was the best way to build something is to do something. Don't try to build a huge institution like we have in Atlanta, which took us 70 years to build up that has everything under the sun, under investigation. Start with something, be successful, and you'll, you'll earn credibility that way. So the, the conclusion was that they would start with event-based surveillance, which uh, is a way of monitoring the continent in a passive way, would not require reports from countries. They can track the media, other reporting systems, to understand where there's flare-ups of various outbreaks across the continent. And, and, of course, at this point, uh, Ebola was, was peaking. After that, I, I had joined Dr. Frieden on the first visit to uh, West Africa, the Ebola um, outbreak. And we came back realizing we had to mobilize every possible resource possible, both in the US government and, and beyond. So I was tasked to work with the, with the African Union to see just the way African Union has done peacekeeping, could they now play a health keeping role in a very similar way by mobilizing experts, and there's great expertise in the African continent, to direct towards the uh, Ebola response. Um, not a lot of people had confidence in that. The African Union had never staged a response to an, an outbreak before, so this was a first. But the African Union had never uh, convened its Security Council over an outbreak before. The African Union had never had a meeting of all African foreign ministers over an outbreak before. So this was unprecedented. So based on uh, the, the, the need to get teams mobilized, the US government, through its weight behind uh, this effort, I have to credit Gail Smith, who was then in the NSC, who took this forward to those who needed to approve it, and she was terrific. Uh, I have to credit Ambassador Brigady, who was our ambassador to the African Union in Addis at the time. He convened the European ambassadors, the Chinese and others, who similarly said, OK, we're in a desperate situation. Let's all throw our weight behind this and, and make it happen. So it was truly an act of diplomacy combined with, with the technical perspective, combined with um, Ethiopian uh, leadership. So I think when we look back, and the African CDC is still evolving, the first training is actually underway now of the first cohort of, of fellows who've graduated from CDC-sponsored training in epidemiology to come spend two years at the African CDC or one of the coordinating centers, which are still going to be decided in the five African Union zones, to staff it up, because that, that will be the key to his success, if it has qualified people who can, who can do the work and achieve success. So it's, 
it's still a work in progress, but I think, you know, if you look back on the history of the U.S. CDC, it, it was formed around malaria eradication in the South. Uh, the, the China CDC came about because of SARS. And I think we'll look back and say the Africa CDC grew out of Ebola. So let me stop there and I look forward to questions. Great. Very interesting. Thanks. Um, let's turn to EJ, uh, who will shift us to uh, kind of regional hard security issues. Um, EJ, why don't you um, begin? And welcome, Deborah. Thanks. So well, thank you very much. Um, I was struggling to really kind of situate my work in the work that you guys are all doing, but um, I'll try to just put some points out there and then hopefully uh, generate some thoughts for discussion uh, and probably <coughs> debate. Uh, no, I think it's quite clear, uh, at least from our perspective, that Ethiopia is arguably the dominant state in the region. Uh, that is the Horn of Africa, uh, certainly the dominant military power, uh, arguably not uh, yet uh, the dominant economic power, uh, which is still pretty much residing in Kenya. Uh, but uh, Ethiopia certainly uh, is a very important country in the Horn of Africa, arguably larger in the region and uh, is increasingly becoming more so. Uh, what is very interesting uh, in the context of, of Ethiopia also is that relative to many of, of the other countries in the region, it actually has uh, relatively good control over its territory, uh, but it's situated in a very difficult uh, neighborhood with lots of uh, conflicts uh, a history of, of rivalries between different states uh, and uh, unfortunately also an, a, a, a war, uh, a border conflict with Eritrea um, that was quite deadly and to some degree still very, very relevant in terms of uh, Ethiopia's security uh, calculations. Uh, that said, um, Ethiopia does actually have a very capable foreign ministry, and I'm not saying this just for the Ethiopian diplomats in the room, uh, but I think most African watchers would argue that Ethiopia punches above its weight uh, in the region uh, and uh, also on the continent and arguably in uh, the world uh, relative to uh, its economic output. Um, and, and I think that's quite important. Uh, it's also uh, actually quite good at intelligence gathering. Um, I'm always impressed by the amount of intelligence and, and, and good analysis that the Ethiopian government has on its neighbors, and, and thus, uh, you know, it, it makes it a relatively astute and agile actor vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its its rivals and uh, and its insertions in or interventions, I should say, in, in conflicts in the region in which it is involved. It also has uh, arguably a, a very large and capable military um, that makes it play a, a, an outside role in the region. Uh, it is a troop contributor to two UN missions in the region itself, not to mention uh, in some other missions. It has, or it is the sole contributor uh, to the UN mission in Abia, uh, where it has about 4,000 troops, if I remember correctly. And uh, it is actually doing quite a good job. Uh, it's impressed the UN and its um, and, 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 and donors in, in, the, in, in how effective it has been at maintaining control in Abia and, um, and keeping that situation. Can you just say a word about Abia? If oh, I apologize. Uh, sorry yeah. for, um, for, so um, one of, or two of, of uh, Ethiopia's neighbors are Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, when <coughs> South Sudan separated from uh, Sudan, uh, there is, there, or there remained a contested border. Uh, a, a significant portion of that was a region called Abia, um, which has historically been a flashpoint for conflict between Sudan and South Sudan. And in an effort to try to keep that situation under control and, and to try to prevent the exacerbation of conflict between Khartoum and Juba, it was decided by the UN to mount a peacekeeping operation. And actually, in, in an exceptional circumstance, the UN agreed to have this mission essentially be fulfilled entirely by one country, uh, which is Ethiopia. Uh, and so you have a UN mission that's led by Ethiopians and largely a man by Ethiopians that's done, uh, as I've suggested, at least in our view, a pretty good job in terms of keeping the two communities from fighting each other. Uh, 
uh, and from keeping uh, that conflict from escalating and then from drawing in the two neighboring states or the, the two, the north and the south. Uh, perhaps as important, uh, Ethiopia is also a very significant troop contributor to uh, the AU mission in Somalia, AMISOM, uh, where it also has a very large contingent uh, hatted under AU auspices, in addition to uh, additional forces that it has decided to, uh, to deploy uh, to try to um, manage the security situation along its eastern border. Um, but, but that obviously makes it play an outside role in, an outsized role, I should say, in, uh, in Somalia, uh, which has both um, arguably a beneficial role, but also a negative one in that uh, Ethiopia uh, has to some degree been able to insulate itself from many of the problems that are present in South and Central Somalia. But this is also oftentimes a very unpopular um, presence in, in um, in, in Somalia, in that uh, one, of the, one of the reasons we actually have seen the rise of Shabaab, uh, which is the um, Islamist uh, insurgency that's fighting uh, the Somali federal government, was actually a previous uh, intervention by, by Ethiopia from 2006 to 2009, uh, when it had moved in for very similar reasons. Um, and basically an insurgency uh, arose against occupation by Ethiopia, um, and so one needs to, to think these things through carefully that we can discuss uh, in Q&A. I think one of the other things that, that, uh, that should be mentioned in, in this context is that obviously Ethiopia has launched a relatively successful state-driven economic development campaign uh, that has led to huge infrastructure projects. Uh, I think everyone is very impressed by how things have changed in Addis Ababa and some of the other urban centers uh, in the country. Uh, obviously, its biggest um, project to date, or at least the most impressive from my perspective, is the Grand Renaissance Dam on the Blue Nile, uh, which when it's completed, will be uh, a major economic driver for the entire region uh, because it's going to be producing a lot of electricity that many of its neighboring states really would like uh, to use uh, for their own development purposes. Uh, and Ethiopia is also very supportive of, of a regional infrastructure uh, program that's trying to link the entire region uh, to Ethiopia, which uh, if successful um, will drive uh, regional integration and, and regional development. Um, and so these are all good things. Um, last but not least, well, uh, two more points actually real quickly. What is interesting about Ethiopia is given that it, it has a relatively effective foreign ministry and a capable military, it also tends to dominate uh, the regional organization, EGAD, uh, which is uh, the dominant organization, uh, pardon me, the dominant organization working on conflicts in uh, the greater Horn of Africa. And so EGAD, by virtue of being dominant in, in uh, I'm sorry, Ethiopia, by virtue of being dominant in EGAD, plays an outside role in uh, the South Sudan peace negotiations, uh, which successfully concluded an agreement in August. Uh, we'll see whether or not that agreement will hold, uh, but it certainly played an outside role. Um, the Ethiopia, obviously, also because of its troops uh, and its, uh, its uh, outside role in, in EGAD plays a dominant role in both continental and international um, policy towards, uh, towards Somalia and, and trying to resolve um, the chronic conflict that's been happening there. And perhaps um, in a bit more of a mixed picture, because EGAD dominates EGAD, it has been able to outflank Eritrea relatively successfully in terms of, of, of international um, uh, policy towards the Horn and, and is thus has been able to fairly effectively isolate Eritrea both regionally and internationally, uh, which I think has profound implications. But that said, uh, I should note that while you know, these things all speak quite well of, of Ethiopia as a regional power, all is not necessarily uh, well. Um, right now, it is a state that's dominated by a single party and arguably dominated by a smaller party within that party, uh, the TPLF. Um, 
it is a community or it's a country with a very large number of ethnic communities uh, that sometimes uh, work together as Ethiopians but sometimes do not. Uh, it is also a country with uh, a very large and rich uh, religious history uh, that is not just encompassed by the Orthodox Church but you have a very large and growing Muslim population. You also have a very large and active evangelical community. And these are creating cleavages that will uh, be important in determining whether or not uh, Ethiopia remains a, a, a stable country with a bright future, or one where um, communal <coughs> discord uh, starts to undermine uh, that progress. And with that, I'll leave it. Great, thank you very much, EJ. Deborah, I've introduced you in your absence uh, and said you talk about um, the bilateral relationship with China, um, Ethiopia's strategy on that, China's strategy, what the downturn in, in China might, might mean um, for some of that, for that relationship. Mm -hmm. So welcome and, and thanks. Uh, the relationship between China and uh, Ethiopia is one of the closest that China has on the African continent. And we can see a number of different uh, examples and evidence of this. Uh, of course, one of the uh, China has a, um, a mechanism for engaging with Africa as a continent. It's called the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. This is a, has a summit or a, a ministerial meeting every three years. And one of those ministerials early on was held in Addis Ababa. And of course, for the Chinese, it's important that Addis is also the head of the African Union. And so. Um, you're probably well aware that the Chinese donated the uh, headquarters building for the African Union in Ada. So the Chinese company built that, and um, it's something that, that helps uh, cement that relationship with the African Union and Africa as a, as a whole, but it's also in Ada. So the, the relationship is, um, I think, particularly close because there's a, a meeting of minds. You've just heard that uh, Ethiopia is basically a single party <laughs> state, uh, authoritarian in nature, um, and of course China is a single party state, authoritarian in nature, um, and so they, they understand that. They don't have a problem at all with Ethiopia being not, as, as, uh, not a liberal democracy. Um, and the Chinese also appreciate that Ethiopia is what we might call a developmental state. So they really, the, the leadership in Ethiopia is very committed to a vision of development, and this is very rare in the African continent. And so you have um, a, an industrial policy that was partly crafted by Mellis um, more than a decade ago. So this is, is something that's very clear about how Ethiopia sees uh, its progress being made. It wants to move uh, toward um, agribusiness and uh, manufacturing that would take advantage of Ethiopia's rich resources in the agricultural sector and move up, uh, up the value chain there. And so we can see um, Chinese interest in partnering with Ethiopia in industrial policy. So many people are aware of the, the famous um, Huajian shoe factory that Helen Hai helped set up in Addis Ababa. This is a, a factory that is um, brought uh, Ethi uh, from China, from the Duangong area. It's brought um, jobs to Ethiopia. Not as many as they originally projected, but there's some three or 4,000 Ethiopians working in this shoe factory now. And others have been coming as well. So the, it's an interesting uh, example, actually, Jennifer, because these shoe companies were first introduced to Ethiopia through a USAID program um, in which they were trying to broker uh, some of this interest in looking at Ethiopian and Ethiopian companies as being uh, ones that might partner um, with uh, the American companies that were located and, and uh, sourcing in China that they might source in Ethiopia. That didn't end up working out. But now they're sourcing from the Chinese companies that have moved into Ethiopia. So this idea of industrial policy and how Ethiopia might fit um, in China's own restructuring effort um, is something that's quite interesting. That's an ongoing discussion and it's an, an evolution that's actually happening quite quickly. Ethiopia is one of the few places in Africa where wage rates are, are very low. Um, it, surprisingly, a lot of, if you look at African wage rates in terms of formal sector wages compared to per capita income, most countries uh, have a, a much higher um, formal sector wage than their per capita income, which uh, suggests that they are not setting their wage rates at a kind of market clearing um, level. That's not the case in Ethiopia. Their wage rates are low, um, which suggests that they can um, 
absorb a lot of labor at those wage rates. And that's what the, the Chinese companies and others that are coming into Ethiopia from China, it's not just Chinese, it's Taiwanese, it's Japanese, it's um, Italian, it's German, it's others who are finding wage rates um, and expenses in uh, China to be something that's pushing them offshore, and so they're looking to Ethiopia as well as, as a lot of places in, in Asia. So that idea that, um, that China and the government in Ethiopia share this developmental vision, and uh, particularly in industrial policy, is one that is, uh, had a meeting of minds between those two. And I think this has been helpful for Ethiopia's development. It's a very strong relationship. A second area in which the relationship is very strong is in terms of Chinese finance for the infrastructure that you're talking about. The Chinese are not financing the Grand Renaissance Dam. This is something Ethiopians are financing themselves. But they have financed several other large hydropower projects in Ethiopia. They're financing part of the railway that's going to be linking Addis to Djibouti. They're finance, they finance the um, urban uh, rail, the, the new urban rail that's just opened in Addis Ababa. They, they are financing wind power projects, the Adama wind power. They're financing a number of, of other pieces of Ethiopian infrastructure. And so this, um, we have a database on Chinese loan finance, and we find that uh, Ethiopia is second only to Angola in terms of the number of loans from Chinese policy banks. So this is quite a, a, a considerable amount of finance that's going into a poor country that was uh, a HIPAA recipient. So they were beneficiaries of the highly indebted poor country's debt relief. And now they are building up um, new, new uh, amounts of debt that come from Chinese banks. So this is something that they're, they're one of the highest in terms of that, that leverage. And the exports that are supposed to be repaying these loans have not been building up at the extent that the Ethiopian authorities hoped they would. So the, the increase in, in exports, for example, from the leather sector, um, from the industrial sector, have been growing. And they've been growing from a low base, but they haven't grown as fast as Ethiopia hopes. Um, and so the jury is still out on whether or not this is going to create a problem for Ethiopia. Formerly indebted, will they be now newly indebted uh, and have a problem with that, repaying that debt? Most of the Chinese finance comes with a five-year grace period, and so these um, questions are still uh, to be determined a little bit down the line. So the, <coughs> the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation was held, uh, uh, they had a summit in Johannesburg this past December. And one of the things the Chinese said that they would um, help the African continent with is building the African CDC. And so I don't believe we know yet where that's going to be located. I don't know. If um, Addis. It is going to be in Addis. Okay, we'll talk so that, about that. That, that, um, that is what I suspected, that it would be located in Addis. Um, so I'm glad to see that it's been confirmed there. Um, so that is something, again, that, that continues to tie um, this. And so the Chinese, no doubt, are going to be, they've offered already to help uh, with constructing that. And I think that'll be, again, another thing that will help cement this relationship. So Chinese companies are also involved, and the Chinese government supports Ethiopia in its uh, agricultural sector. Um, a lot of this is a, a vision which is outmoded in Africa, but the Ethiopians still uh, um, subscribe to it, which is large state-owned farms. So you can see this in the sugar sector. So the Ethiopian government has set up a number of different state-owned farms. These are owned by the Ethiopian Sugar Corporation, but they're being constructed not just by Chinese companies, but by Ch some of them are being constructed by Chinese companies. Um, and the, the sugar refineries and uh, factories are being constructed um, by Chinese firms. And there's Chinese finance, considerable Chinese finance going into this as well. So in on a number of different areas in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the development model, in terms of industrial policy and uh, the development of factories, um, and in terms of uh, supporting Ethiopia's role as being an African leader uh, through having the AU there and then being a, a political, an important political country that punches above its weight, I think, in Africa, that's a close relationship. And there aren't very many areas of conflict. Uh, the, the Chinese government is pretty comfortable with Ethiopia, and um, they're, again, they don't like to interfere in other countries' internal affairs, and they're certainly not telling Ethiopia what to do in terms of elections or in, in governance issues. So, let me stop there. Yeah, that's great. I, I think we'll um, turn to discussion. Um, I maybe have a, I have questions for all of you. I maybe should limit myself. Um, but Tom, on the CDC, the African CDC, mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of size are you thinking? I tend to be skeptical of kind of continent-wide initiatives 
that maybe draw resources and even personnel away from national entities that need mm -hmm. them. Just as the Africa Standby Force mm -hmm. is being very slow to take off, I wonder if the, if the CDC... No, it's, <clears throat> that's a great question. And um, one where, when I was still at CDC, we were cautious in, in providing any sort of directive. You know, we said, well, what do you want it to do? And I think that was actually, and has, still is part of the problem, after health ministers heard their heads of state have said, we're going to do this, they're like, well, what, are we, what is it going to do? Um, and they had a hard time articulating that, except when Ebola came about, and it was clear that there was a need for countries to call upon one another during a crisis. Um, it's going to be a challenge to finance, so, uh, because the AU draws on annual fees from the countries. There, there's already an agreement that some of the New Africa CDC will be covered by that, but it's a relatively small amount. Um, as to where it's going to be located, that was a heated <laughs> uh, diplomatic discussion, and we, we definitely stayed out of that um, discussion. And in the end, uh, after tremendous diplomacy, it took, took six to nine months, uh, the health ministers agreed that the, they're not calling it the headquarters, they're calling it the coordinating center, uh, is at, Af at, in, at, Addis Ababa, at the African Union, which to me makes total sense because you have the diplomats there as well. You have infrastructure and, and a culture of, of African solidarity and working together. So it's, it's the right place rather than sticking it off in another country. But another country could have made sense because of better telecommunications, for example, which, as we all know, is not so hot in, in, in Ethiopia for a variety of reasons. So, um, <laughs> I think it's going to start it off in a modest level. Uh, the U.S. government was sponsoring, like I said, uh, these 10 African epidemiologists who are trained in the field epidemiology training program to staff it up, to, de to develop a... And they're from across the... Yeah. Across the... From each of the five zones that the African <laughs> Union has. Um, and now <clears throat> the, the plan is to set up five regional coordinating centers that will deal... <laughs> Uh, using the same lines that the African Union already draws, north, south, east, west, central, um, and approach public health events in, in those zones. And when they need to, they'll call uh, the central uh, office for s support. We've discouraged from just building a monolithic building and calling that the Africa CDC. There's a lot of capabilities already on the continent. It'll take time to build that up. One big question was, well, where do we build the laboratory? And we said, well, what laboratory? You know, because who's going to send you specimens? Why would they send you specimens? What's your reason for existing? Are you going to be a reference laboratory for the entire continent? Or, and there's already the African Society for Laboratory Medicine mentioned in the previous panel that has a lot of potential for bringing together a, a pan-African approach to laboratory support. So there's a lot still at play. I think the most critical thing is to get a visionary leader in place, there's, and to get it out of this political uh, whirlpool that it's in at the moment, it will be established as what's called a specialized institution where it will be free from the political process. And the African Union is a political organ, but it's evolving, and others would know that better. This was one way for it to do something substantial in, in public health. Um, but by getting the right staff at the right level, having representation, of the continent, that's, that's one of the struggles that the African Union has, to make sure they have representation from all, all five zones. So there's a lot left to happen, yet to happen, but I think this is a decades long investment. This is not something that's gonna be done next month or a year from now or five years from now. I think 30, 40 years from now we'll look back and say, I hope that this was a wise decision. If it doesn't get out of the political process, if it doesn't get a visionary leader, and if it isn't finance, it won't work. Is that simple? Strikes me more than a standby health force, you need kind of a, uh, a health national guard in a way that doesn't. Right, grow. and drawing from countries that already uh, hopefully have functioning public health systems, and, and they have that skill set so that when a big event comes along, they, they can, can ramp up. But, you know, how many Ebolas are we actually ever going to have? Are they going to come back and come to? You know, we had a TB presentation earlier and malaria and HIV, which we didn't tackle because those were already having some momentum. What about non-communicable diseases where very little is being done? Maybe that's 
that's something substantial they could, they could sink their teeth into. Great, thanks. I have questions for EJ, but I'll see if they come up in discussion. And Deborah, I, um, you know, the relationship with the Ethiopian government is very good. I wonder, because of that close partnership and some of the contra public controversies within Ethiopia around land and agricultural policy and so forth, if there's kind of pushback at, in a public opinion on the relationship at all. Uh, that's a good question, Jennifer. I'm not sure if uh, Ethiopia is included in the various uh, public opinion surveys, for example, the Afrobarometer, the BBC, or the Pew surveys. I don't know if anyone knows out there. Some of those surveys have asked questions about uh, public opinion about China within African countries. And it, it doesn't strike me that Ethiopia is, is there, so I'm not sure we actually know. And I always hesitate to say what do, you know, what do the Ethiopians feel about China without data. So I would probably skip that over. I've certainly talked to plenty of taxi drivers and plenty of Ethiopians about, but I, I, that's not a scientific survey. Mm -hmm. So I do think that uh, in terms of the agricultural issue, um, there isn't any Chinese agricultural investment in Ethiopia. So there, aside from a few um, vegetable farms that supply uh, the markets in, with Chinese vegetables, very small farms. Um, so these, these things are financing Ethiopian, mainly the factories, I believe, and as an export from China. There is, of course, uh, other, there's Indian investment in agriculture, and there's uh, the Saudi Alamudi, Saudi Star investment in agriculture. And these have been quite controversial down in Gambella. Uh, there's been also the villagization program, which the Ethiopian government has implemented, which is reminiscent of uh, the one we saw in Tanzania a few Ujama. decades ago, the Ujama villages, to try to um, actually get people off of that valuable agricultural land and then cluster them so that services can be delivered to, village, to nomadic people in, in villages. So this has been quite controversial. And there's been um, Human Rights Watch, I think, has done reports on that. Uh, there's not really a, a big China angle there on agriculture. Mm -hmm. Why don't we open for questions, and I'll put my glasses on. Um, and uh, yes, we'll take a couple. Yes, the lady in white here, and then Tony, and the lady here. <coughs> yeah, my name is Esther Guan. Uh, I'm the Global Health Advisor for Samaritan's Bus, uh, based in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, this forum has been really great to discuss some of the things that are happening in Ethiopia. We actually don't work in Ethiopia, but because of the size of the country in Africa, we thought it was uh, important for me to attend this meeting. Uh, I think I want to talk about what I didn't hear, because what I heard was really good. Uh, I didn't hear very much about the sustainable development goals that are rolling out now. I heard about non-communicable diseases from uh, the question you just asked in the last few minutes. And uh, as an international relief organization, I was listening out for um, the response to the low rainfall of last year and what we're doing about uh, food sustainability in the country. I didn't hear that. So I don't know if there's another forum for that. Uh, if um, we just missed yeah. out something. Yeah. Thank you. Just on that last point, um, we're going to be holding in March a, a conference uh, on El Nino and the impacts and kind of uh, reductive safety nets and, and so forth. And Ethiopia, I think, will be one of the cases that we look at uh, in terms of the food shortages as well. Um, we'll take a couple and then come back to the, um, to the table mm -hmm. here. Uh, Tony. Hi, I'm, I'm Tony Carroll. I'm a senior associate here at the Africa program. Uh, EJ, um, I just would like to push you a little bit more on the Eritrean-Ethiopian relationship. Um, I consider the border closure an economic drag in both countries. And as Paul Collier has told us in years past, that maybe the smartest thing you can do if you're a landlocked country in Africa is invest in your neighbor who has border access. And it seems to me that 
One of the constraints on Ethiopia's ability to export more robustly is the transportation costs are still very, very high. And they, re they will remain high until they can maximize some of their port access. So I'm wondering, um, you know, politics aside, which of course is impossible, uh, but, uh, you know, can we take a crystal ball here and, and, and get a, something of an assessment of where things stand and, and possibilities of a rapprochement or some sort of re, you know, opening of that border so that I think both, con both economies would certainly benefit greatly from. Why don't we come back to the panel um, quickly and then we can fit in probably another one more round of questions. Um, does anyone want to comment on the SDGs and some of the elements that were missing? No. Okay. <laughs> I can just come back, uh, not to the Africa CDC, but my five years in Ethiopia with CDC, that Ethiopia took the Millennium Development Goals very, very seriously. And, and we're very conscious of how they were viewed in the, on the global stage in terms of meeting those targets. And maternal mortality was one of them. And there was a, you know, evidence was that they were not going to reach that. And, and, and almost overnight, uh, the Ministry of Health put in place a, a program to address uh, obstetrical emergencies. So I would assume the same would be the case with the SDGs, which are all embedded in number three of 17. So, uh, but I, I would be optimistic that in the case of Ethiopia, they would take those very seriously. And then EJ, you had a, a couple of questions there. Um, <clears throat> well, you had, you had two very good questions. I mean, I think that they're kind of hard to, to answer. I mean, I mean, clearly, one of the things I think that the, the government will have to struggle with is this, is this balance between an inclusive government that uh, addresses the, the legitimate grievances of certain communities uh, versus its state building activities. And, um, you know, that's always a, a, a difficult um, path to, to, to tread. Uh, I mean, I think that everyone feels that right now things are relatively stable in Ethiopia, but if this comes ultimately at the expense of marginalizing certain communities, that there is, is a risk that we could see a resumption of uh, you know, these ethnic rebellions which have plagued Ethiopia historically. Uh, and again, that's something that uh, I think a lot of groups have kind of written on and, and, and have had uh, constructive or perhaps not so constructive debates with the Ethiopian government about. Uh, but I mean, these are concerns. It's the reason why I mentioned that, uh, you know, Ethiopia is a very rich country in, in terms of different ethnic groups, uh, but it's also a, a country that's divided along other lines, particularly religious lines. And, and I think those uh, issues need to be accommodated in, a, in an inclusive manner. Uh, otherwise, there are risks to uh, the country's long-term stability uh, and obviously also to its, its long-term economic uh, development. Uh, I think um, I'm not exactly sure what your question is on, on the Sudan-Ethiopian border. I'm not aware of any kind of real border disputes, but certainly what is a problem for um, both Ethiopia and Sudan to a certain degree is you have uh, these conflicts um, in, 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 in the Blue Nile in particular, uh, where uh, you have armed groups moving back and forth across uh, the border. Uh, my understanding is that there actually are some smaller uh, ethnic communities on the Ethiopian side that do the same thing. And so this is a... <coughs> This is an active border where uh, I think you know certain where, well where there certainly is insecurity and where both uh, you know the Sudanese government but but much more so the Ethiopian government have uh, security concerns. Uh, my understanding is that the Ethiopian government has that relatively well under control, uh, which is um, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think, um, but this also applies, I should say, farther down south, where actually I think it's a bigger issue um, with. Uh, you know, with the, the, the currently, at least temporarily ended war um, between largely new air opposition and largely Dinka government, you've seen a lot of population movements between an area called the Greater Upper Nile uh, and some areas in Ethiopia that are also populated by ethnic kin. Um, and so my understanding is that uh, the government has had, the Ethiopian government has had the struggle with some of the security implications of a very large new air refugee population uh, 
and then also the influx of both fighters and arms from South Sudan into Ethiopia, uh, which is one reason why I mentioned that you know Ethiopia is in a very, very difficult regional environment where you know you cannot insulate yourself from conflicts in Somalia, from conflicts in Sudan and South Sudan, or arguably even conflicts in Eritrea, which is one reason to get back to your question again where we would feel strongly that it is in both Eritrea and Ethiopia's interest to try to move this rapprochement or to try to get to a point of rapprochement between Eritrea and Ethiopia rather than this kind of frozen conflict that we have now uh, that is negatively impacting both countries. Um, the reason I kind of mentioned Eritrea's isolation is that one of the big concerns that crisis group does have is we have in, in Eritrea an extremely authoritarian state, uh, which is bleeding um, its youth population at a, uh, well, at the highest rate on the continent. Uh, if you look at African refugee migration into Europe, it's actually Eritreans that make up the largest uh, refugee population. And that's largely because of, of, of Ethi er I should say, pardon me, Eritrea's decision that it's going to maintain a very large military mobilization, in part because it fears that it's going to be in a war with Ethiopia again. But that has all kinds of mid and long term implications for Eritrea's stability. And we are very concerned, and we've written about this in a number of reports, were Isaiah to die unexpectedly, and he has been ill for quite some time. There is no clear succession pattern, um, or there's no clear succession mechanism uh, within the TP, uh, um, within the um, Eritrean People's Liberation Front, um, and that this could then mean that you have a struggle over power in Asmara, which could quickly lead to you know state collapse, like we've seen in places like Libya, uh, and that would be or should be of great concern. Uh, to the Eritrea, I'm sorry, to the Ethiopia. Ethiopian government. <laughs> Don't get those two mixed up. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Um, Steve, we have time for a couple more questions. Let's just take two more. Um, the lady in blue. Lulit uh, Masun, Gumbot 7, Movement for Democracy in Ethiopia. Um, I've been listening to this conversation uh, from uh, early on. Um, you get the World Bank or the IMF gets cook numbers from the central um, uh, agency, statistics, statistics agency in Ethiopia, and um, they're talking about this wonderful development. First of all, what you need to know is the TPLF itself is a state within a state, and I appreciate the point that you made uh, everybody's talking about EPR, they have ruling Ethiopia. It's the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which represents only 6% of the population that's actually the power. And then they have about 300 companies within Ethiopia that's doing all this construction business, looting the money, and um, finally, you know, they're not sending it to China. They're building buildings here, they're buying properties, they're okay. just, you know, looting the country blind. So. And it's a good thing that you mentioned Malles, when Malles invaded uh, Somalia for the first time, Ethiopia has never invaded any country, Somalia for the first time, uh, Malles created Al-Shabaab. Shabaab was no, okay, you know, was no longer there. So it's very important not to you know, uh, paint all these good pictures about Ethiopia. It has, there has to be stability inside Ethiopia for the region to be stable. And the most destabilizing factor in the region Thank is you. the TPLF Thank itself. You. I, I hope you were at this morning's session on kind of some of the government governance issues. We had a session on human rights and governance. Uh, hmm. Yes, gentleman here. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ishtul uh, I'm from IMT Biotechnologies. Uh, about the proposed uh, CTC laboratory, uh, I was thinking maybe uh, establish a center of excellence would be good because uh, there is no model laboratories in the country that can teach or demonstrate, you know, uh, laboratory techniques and uh, so forth. So uh, I think to start with, as a, a established ex uh, a center of excellence, would be a good idea. Uh, so they can bring students or professionals in that uh, site and train them. And uh, you know, they can 
uh, establish a, a standard uh, laboratory techniques in Ethiopia, and uh, that's just an idea. Thank you. No, okay. Yes, lady here. Yes. <clears throat> Um, hi again, it's Hermela Haile, um, I'm a uh, epidemiology student at GW. Um, one thing that I feel like is largely ignored is the homeless epidemic. Um, they're heavily marginalized, it's primarily young mothers with children, and I don't really think Ethiopia can really grow unless there's a social welfare model that is advocating for those who clearly don't have a voice. Um, I was wondering if you guys had any ideas on how we can um, uh, create a social welfare model, because the idea of social work is like not existent in Ethiopia, I've asked. They don't even know what it is. Um, so I really, truly think that Ethiopia can't grow unless uh, we deal with those who are in need within their own state. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, I don't know if anyone wants to uh, tackle. I think, you know, I, I think it's some, I, on, on the homeless issue, I, I uh, you know, that, that's an interesting point, something I think to look at and see if the social safety net, which in food security is any way extended to kind of homeless and, and people who are in need in, in other ways. Um, I hope we can explore that at the conference in March. Um, yeah. I <laughs> On the lab one, uh, yeah, I, I would encourage you to visit the Ethiopian Public Health Institute, EPHI, which is the CDC of Ethiopia. And, and there have been major um, investments through, through PEPFAR when I was there and Global Fund and other investments to, to scale up laboratory services. But more importantly, to get them out into the periphery where the people are. And there was a similar effort. We, we constructed eight regional public health laboratories that then have a, a network that feed into them. So I, while I, there's more to do, I think there's been a lot of progress over the last decade in that regard. Thank you very much um, to our panelists. I do. I don't want to keep you much over time. And thank you to the audience for um, sticking with us. Uh, Steve Morrison. I think we'll close out the conference. Um, Steve. Thank you all for coming. It's been a, a really rich uh, four hours of discussion. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm particularly grateful to to the three authors who uh, uh, put the wonderful papers together based on the, on, on the, on the travel of, delega of the delegation. Uh, we made a decision uh, a year and a half ago that Ethiopia was going to be a, a major focus of our work intersecting in a number of different ways. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that this session sort of reveals why that was a good decision. I mean, it's 25 years this May when Mengistu fell and EPRDF came to power in that period the complexity of the relationship, the complexity of the developments, the degree to which it plays in many different spheres and in and figures in strategic thinking, it's, 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 it's quite amazing and, uh, and I think quite worthy of this type of, of, of careful deliberation across uh, many different uh, uh, sectors and using different lenses. Uh, Sahil, thank you so much for all of your uh, <clears throat> prodigious efforts in pulling us all together. Kiburatana Kiburan Tamilka Chuchachin Seleta Katatalachu, but I'm a Sagana low on him. A state monet Yakakalachu, but I'm a meadow so good. And Rasabat zero sauce to send the summon cement, who less sauce to the tain cement? Doubling. Yeh, TG, television no, as the Gajanakrabi, Messon Bazonin, then on ruling.